dinosaur fish is a term I've heard used to describe a whole host of large, terrifying, prehistoric animals like Megalodon, Tunkalosteus, the Mosasaurus, and others, but the term is actually nonsense, scientifically speaking. Let me explain. And even if you haven't heard the term dinosaur fish before, stick around because there's plenty to learn about dinosaurs, fish, and the animals commonly mistaken for dinosaur fish that I'm sure you'd love to hear about. The first step in understanding the contradiction that is a dinosaur fish is to define what a dinosaur is. There are a few ways to define it, and all the definitions end up agreeing with each other. But the most clear-cut one is any descendant of the last common ancestor shared by Triceratops and birds. Yes, birds are dinosaurs under this definition. Specifically, they are theropod dinosaurs, which is the same group as Velociraptors and Tyrannosaurus rex. Really, pulls the majesty out of dinosaurs, huh? The historical and morphological reasons for this grouping are not really relevant for this video, but let me know in the comments if you would be interested in a dedicated video. If you are a Yek or an Oek, and so you don't like using phylogenetics or evolution from a common ancestor, and therefore deem this definition of dinosaurs insufficient, do not fear. Another definition for dinosaurs works just as well, and deals with their physical characteristics rather than their ancestry. This definition is an archosaur that has hind limbs erect below the body. The erect limbs are easy enough to see. Dinosaurs and mammals have them, whereas other archosaurs and generally reptiles have sprawling legs, like an alligator's. Well then, that begs the question, what is an archosaur? The phylogenetic definition for archosaurs is all descendants of the last common ancestor between birds and crocodiles. Wow, we just can't seem to escape birds, huh? But for archosaurs, there are again unique physical characteristics that link them together. We're already getting lost in the weeds in technicalities and definitions, so I won't go through all the characteristics, but I will mention a few, especially the ones that are easier to understand. Who really cares about ant orbital fenestrae anyways? Firstly, archosaurs all lay eggs, so they are oviparous. Obviously, this is not unique to archosaurs, but it still separates them from other groups, such as mammals. They also have unidirectional airflow in their lungs. This means that air will be pushed through the lungs without ever stagnating and mixing with old, deoxygenated air. Instead, it will move continuously through, never being in the same location within the lung twice, before being exhaled through the trachea. Side note, this is very efficient and allows birds to fly in low oxygen environments, and is partly why crocodilians are so good at holding their breath. Another commonality shared amongst the archosaurs is a radius, which is a lower arm bone, shorter than 80% of the humerus's length. Finally, archosaurs have a four-chambered heart, with two atriums and two ventricles, a right and a left of each. This is more efficient than the typical reptilian three-chambered heart that allows oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to mix in the one ventricle. Although this trait is not completely unique to the archosaurs, because mammals also have a four-chambered heart, it's still useful in separating them from other related species. Again, there are more morphological characteristics that group the archosaurs together if you'd like to look into it. But to keep this video from getting too long, uh, we can leave our definition of an archosaur here. Now that we have dinosaur defined, we've completed half the puzzle for what a dinosaur fish would be. All we need to do now is define what a fish is. According to Merriam-Webster, a fish is any of numerous cold-blooded, strictly aquatic, craniate vertebrates that include the bony fishes, and usually the cartilaginous and jawless fishes, and that have typically an elongated, somewhat spindle-shaped body, terminating in a broad, caudal fin. Limbs, in the form of fins when present at all, and a two-chambered heart, by which blood is sent through thoracic gills to be oxygenated. It's okay if you didn't get all that. You can just use your common sense for what a fish is, and you'll be right 90% of the time. This definition is based on physical characteristics, and there is actually no perfect phylogeny-based definition for fish, because groups of related species, or clades, can never leave a larger clade that its ancestors were a part of. For instance, a dog could never evolve out of being a mammal, nor could a bird evolve out of being a reptile. They're stuck. As you can see here, tetrapods, which includes all terrestrial vertebrates, 
such as us, fall under the lobe-finned fish clade of Cercopterygii. So we and all terrestrial animals should be called fish, specifically lobe-finned fish, if it was a scientific definition. But before you go and get your snorkel and flippers to move in with your fishy brethren, know that no one really believes we are fish, because this definition obviously goes against the common understanding of what you and I know a fish is, so the term fish is left without a phylogenetic definition to avoid this confusion. Now, my dear viewer, you may say, come on, Thurber, it's very easy to distinguish between fish and non-fish on this cladogram. Just cut out tetrapods, and all the other vertebrates can be very reasonably be described as fish. And yes, this is possible, and what many people do to show which families are commonly called fish. But doing this breaks the aforementioned rule about descendants evolving out of their parents' clade, which is a big no-no in phylogenetics. But this definition, although not really scientific, can still be used as a quick overview of families that are commonly called fish. Now that we have defined what dinosaur and fish are, it should become obvious why there are no dinosaur fish. If you use the shorthand definition of fish provided by phylogeny, then tetrapods are excluded from being fish, but dinosaurs are very comfortably wholly within tetrapods. So there can't be any dinosaurs that are also fish, and vice versa. Physically, the most obvious reason dinosaur fish don't exist is that dinosaurs must have erect hind limbs that extend directly beneath them, but fish don't have legs or any sort of limb that can be extended below their body. Fish also have two-chambered hearts and gills, but dinosaurs, being archosaurs, have four-chambered hearts and lungs. To further illustrate this point, let's look at some animals that could be commonly referred to as dinosaur fish and see why they're not. First, let's look at the mighty mosasaur, proud plesiosaur, and indomitable ichthyosaur, as they are similar enough for our purposes. You may have seen the mosasaur in the Jurassic World franchise, and these leviathans lived between 146 and 66 million years ago, spanning the length of the Cretaceous, and they could potentially grow up to 17 meters or 56 feet in length. They also had a stocky build, looking like the unfortunate love child between a crocodile, T-Rex, and whale. As you can imagine, they were carnivorous, large enough to eat anything they came across, including other mosasaurs. Like the mosasaur, plesiosaurs were also carnivorous, although not always top dogs in the food chain. They lived from 233 to 66 million years ago, from the mid-Triassic all the way through to the end of the Cretaceous. They could grow up to 15 meters, or 49 feet, but much of their length was tied up in their long necks. Indeed, plesiosaurs were generally much thinner and lighter than mosasaurs of similar size, and apparently they are scoish, if you believe the theories about the Loch Ness Monster. Ichthyosaurs lived 250 to 90 million years ago, from the beginning of the Triassic to the mid to late Cretaceous, and they could grow up to 20 meters, or 66 feet. The range of sizes and niches, though, is quite large, but they were all carnivorous, with most eating small cephalopods or fish. But some rose above the ranks and attained macro-predator status, able to pick on someone their own size. Generally, the ichthyosaurs resembled modern dolphins in appearance, but hopefully not behavior. All of these marine animals were reptilian, large, and ancient, same as dinosaurs, so it's easy to see why people could make the connection. However, they had fins that sprawled out to the side, not limbs that stood erect beneath them, so not morphologically dinosaurs, and they were not archosaurs, instead they were all part of different groups, these being ichthyosauria, plesiosauria, and squamata. Also, none of these are even fish. Despite their loss of legs, they are still tetrapods, which, as discussed earlier, are the only vertebrates exempt from fish status and physically they lack gills or a two-chambered heart, so being neither dinosaur nor fish, none of these could be dinosaur fish. Another common dinosaur fish is the megalodon, which lived 20.3 to 3.6 million years ago. A rather modern addition to this list, these sharks could have gotten as large as 20.3 meters, or 67 feet, and weighed over 100 metric tons. Although size estimates are difficult, because often all you'll find of them are teeth, because their skeletons were made of cartilage, a feature shared among sharks, and cartilage doesn't fossilize easily. 
The Megalodon's exact appearance is therefore up for debate, but it's usually depicted as a large, great white shark, and if not that, it probably did look like some recognizable shark, be it sand tiger, whale, basking, or lone. But obviously, the Megalodon was not a dinosaur. Again, sprawled fins, two-chambered heart, gills, all physical characteristics that keep them from achieving dinosaurhood. However, they are definitely fish, specifically in the class Chondrichthyes, otherwise known as the cartilaginous fish. Another common suspect, mislabeled as a dinosaur fish, is the Dunkelosteus. And it's easy to see why. Just look at that ugly mug. This face, that only a mother could love, was found 382 to 358 million years ago, in the late Devonian. Equipped with reinforced, bone-crushing jaws, the Dunkelosteus was a carnivore that specialized in armored prey. These monsters could reach 10 meters in length, or 33 feet, and weighed between 1 to 4 metric tons. However, a recent paper published by Engelman in 2023 suggests that the Dunkelosteus was much stockier than previously thought, and thus only reached about 4.1 meters, or 13 feet. Quite the downgrade, if you ask me. These short kings are in the class Placodermy, or armored fish. However, they are not dinosaurs, given the same morphological reasons as the other fish included on this list, such as a two-chambered heart, sprawled fins, and gills. Phylogenetically, they are not in the clade Tetrapoda, and definitely not Archosauria, so they're not dinosaurs. The final animal I will cover is the coelacanth, which has been talked about quite a lot for something so mundane looking, which is twice as unfortunate because its name is not intuitive to pronounce. The coelacanth first appears in the fossil record 410 million years ago, in the early Devonian. They were believed to have gone extinct 66 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous. This was until two living species were found off the eastern coast of Africa and Indonesia in 1938. This obviously caused quite a stir, having a fossil come back from the dead like that. And this makes it both the most ancient and the longest lasting species on this list by a landslide. The fish itself can get up to 2 meters or 6.6 .6 feet, and weigh around 90 kilograms or 200 pounds, and looks like most other fish, quite frankly. There are some unique characteristics, of course, such as lobed fins, which set it apart from 95% of all other fish, fused kidneys, and a fat-filled vestigial lung used for buoyancy. There are a few others, but none are too important for the point I'm trying to make. These are clearly just fish and not dinosaurs, because, say it with me, sprawled fins, a two-chambered heart, and the presence of gills, as well as other fish-related reasons. And like the Dunkelosteus and the Megalodon, they are not archosaurs or even tetrapods, although for being a fish, they are pretty close. There may be other mislabeled dinosaur fish out there that I missed. In fact, if you look up dinosaur fish, the first animal that comes up is a modern fish called the Arapaima, which is just a fish. The point that I hope I've made by showing all these examples, though, is that the morphological and phylogenetic definitions of dinosaur and fish are mutually exclusive and cannot overlap. The only way would be for a fully aquatic dinosaur species to be newly discovered, and for you to really stretch the definition of what a fish is to be the archaic anything that lives in the water, which is why starfish and cuttlefish have their names despite not being fish. The animals that are sometimes referred to as dinosaur fish are actually very interesting and unique, and deserve the attention that I hope to have given them. But dinosaurs, they are not. That's why dinosaur fish never really existed. Hey, thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. I have a longer, more well-researched video planned, but it was taking too long to make, uh, so I decided to make a quick video I thought was fun in the meantime. The idea for this video came from my friends who constantly remind me of dinosaur fish whenever animals are mentioned as a running joke. So, in response, I decided to dedicate multiple days of my life to prove them wrong. Your move, Xander. Donnie. But in all seriousness, I do find this stuff interesting, so it wasn't too much of a chore. Who doesn't love dinosaurs and cladistics? And I hope that you also found it fun. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my friend son of and who majors in at and lives at his phone number and email are 
and and his social security number is Anyway, he looked over the script and kept it from being too technical, so huge thank you to him. As always, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. And also, feel free to leave a comment down below for another topic you'd like to see me cover, or if I miss something. But that's all for now, so goodbye and stay learning.